Yeah. I predict that you will laugh at least three times. Hello. Hello. And I think we are live on YouTube. I am? We are right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> My language is complete. <laughs> right? You're checking? Yeah. Okay. Then I will answer Miranda's message. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, there. It's better. It's better than normal. What did it take two years to make it better? No, it takes it two weeks to make it better. <laughs> oh, your oh, 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 That's not so what satellite Yes, never actually. I know I have to drive to go. I just want to say the baby. Oh, we are live already. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Is there a way to know? Yeah, but it's but that's on um oh, we should switch this to other people. Yes, there are eight watching already. Oh, uh, fine. Yeah. Here? Oh, Can we yes, see fine. Who? Uh, no, we fine. cannot see who. But anyway, it's a muscle somewhere. Yeah, but you guys can all say hi. Hello. Hello. Why do we say hi? Here's oh, here. Hi. I'll switch this to Zoom. Even oh, so this is what they see. Okay. okay. So they'll see mostly this, but then they'll see you here. Awesome. And then all they right. can adjust on their side if they want to yeah. make it more side by side. I can't change that for them, but they can change that on their side. Sounds good. Okay. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So you guys get Jackie. I just can't wait for you. Rob, are we ready to start? Yes. Are we good to start? Okay. Yeah, they're starting. Yes, exactly. Oh, we should wait for this show. Okay. Lots of preparation. Thank you for your patience while we get situated here. Yeah, well, we're waiting on you. We're waiting on you and you're waiting on us. Hello, everybody. Bonjour. I'm bienvenue to the Canadian light source. I'm trying a little bit of French, I'm practicing. I'm not very good, but I'm learning. Um, I would like to, to welcome you here. For those of you that are here, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. For those of you that are online, thank you for your time and for coming. Uh, I'm gonna leave all of the other welcomes and acknowledgements to this wonderful group from Montreal and gonna let them introduce themselves. Are you ready? Yes. Are you guys ready? Yes. Then I'm getting out of the way because they need the space. Okay, what? 
So we would first like to acknowledge how much students on the beam line has been beneficial from an educational standpoint. As students, our learning journey about the scientific process, teamwork, the synchrotron has been tremendous. Our community is also already very invested in our project, and we think that they'll be even more interested once we go back home with our results. As part of the reconciliation process, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the CLS in Saskia Toon, Saskatchewan is situated in the traditional homeland of the Metis. Indeed, this territory is known as the Treaty 6, and nations such as Mejillawak Cree, Anishinaabeg, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota occupy this place. We also recognize that our school, Postenak Senolibaki, in Montreal, Siotiaki, Quebec, is situated on the unceded indigenous lands of the Kanyen, Kehaka, and Mohawk. It is a known gathering place for many nations. We dedicate ourselves to moving forward in the spirit of partnership, reconciliation, and collaboration. <clears throat> Okay, push the space bar. Oh, or not. Oh. Oh, okay. 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 So here are a few pictures about us and our school. It's time for reconciliation. Um, so as for our research subject, we tried to pick one that was linked to heavy metals because this is what the ideas beam line allowed us to detect. We quickly came across many news articles about heavy metal contamination in Quebec soil. So this is something local and dear to our heart. One indicated that 23% of soil samples near Juan Nahanda's corn smelter exceeded the concentration limits for arsenic, cadmium, and lead. As, as if this wasn't enough, this issue also appeared to be present in communal gardens in Montreal, as well as unregulated waste dumping sites in Kenesatake, a Mohawk community reserve. This last article especially caught our attention because we wish to connect our scientific approach with Indigenous communities. So now you might ask yourself, why is this issue preoccupying? A large presence of heavy metals in the soil can be dangerous and negatively affect plants, animals, uh, human health, and also be bioaccumulated in organs. However, heavy metal in small quantity can also contribute to the good functionality of the body. Also, dispersion of these contaminants is not complicated when you consider that water and underground insects and animals can move them from a contaminated soil to an uncontaminated soil. You can imagine that a small problem can grow exponentially. So we definitely had heavy metal contamination on our mind when we came across the concept of phytoremediation a few weeks later. In this process, plants are used to extract heavy metals from contaminated soil. Their absorption mechanism allows the contaminants from the below ground tissues to travel within the structure towards the above ground tissues. The same mechanism for, to extract heavy metals is used so that the plant can absorb the nutrient it needs to grow properly and for it to develop. So in other words, the plant naturally absorbs heavy metals from the soil as a part of their metabolism and need to absorb nutrients through photo extraction. Humans use this natural advantage to decontaminate uh, polluted soil or contaminated soil. We also learned about the Three Sisters as another effort to link reconciliation with our project. This is a traditional indigenous agricultural method that allows three crops, corn, beans, and squash, to grow simultaneously and benefit from each other while doing so. 
we then contacted Xavier Watso, an indigenous content creator, to make sure that squash, our plant of choice, was a, still a staple in contemporary indigenous cuisine. It was, it was, so we went forward with this idea. So considering all this research and the questions that stemmed from it, uh, we formulated our research question as the following. So what is squash's phytoremediation potential and is a fruit grown in contaminated soil safe to consume? Mm -hmm. And so based on literature, we formulated the following hypothesis. Since our research question has two parts to it, so does the hypothesis. So the first one is that the squash plants will have absorbed the heavy metals in its abound, above ground structures, whether this includes the fruit or not, and therefore the squash would be an adequate phytoremediator. And then the second one would be that it would not be safe to consume squash uh, that was grown in contaminated soil. To answer our research question, we grew plants in both uncontaminated and contaminated soil contained in bins. We obtained the latter by contaminating the soil ourselves with nickel, copper, zinc, and lead. The concentrations picked for the contaminated soil are the average between the maximum acceptable for residential plots and the maximum acceptable for other non-agricultural activities. We then prepared a solution with metal salts that had the amount of metal to attain the desired concentrations in the bins of earth. That being said, the uncontaminated bin grew the plants we used as controls. So we did frequent sampling during our plants four months ago. We sampled many plants hard at various days. We arrived to scale it even with 129 samples in our suitcase. So we had to do a lot of shopping to fill the space. <laughs> so we'll briefly explain the anatomy of the plant, just the samples that we collected for better understanding later on. So we collected samples of the roots, the stem, the leaf, and the stamens that are the male reproductive organs of the squash. And so once we gathered our samples, we used the synchrotron to obtain our results. But before we speak about that, I'm going to explain briefly what the synchrotron is and how it works. And so the synchrotron is a machine that produces different kinds of light in order to detect the presence of certain atoms. But where does the light come from? Basically, electrons are emitted and then they are directed around the rings and accelerated nearly to the speed of light. So 99.999% of the speed of light. And when electrons go around the vents, they give off energy in, a, in the form of a highly focused light. And that is led to the beam light that we use, the IDS1. And so for our experiment, we used the X-ray fluorensis technique to analyze our samples, which consists of sending X-rays that will interact with them. And so you may be wondering why X or F, well, it offers us the opportunity to keep some of our samples intact instead of running them, dissolving them, and obtaining data through chemical treatment. But Olivia, what happens when X-ray interacts with the sample? It's simple. So this is the X-ray that interacts with the sample, and then the uh, an electron from the atom is ejected from the K subshell, which causes the atom to become unstable. And so um, another electron will try to fill in the gap that was created by changing subshells from the L to the K. And by doing so, a photon will be emitted. And a photon is a tiny unit of light, and it will be sent to the beam time to be detected. And so what's important to know is that each atom reacts and gets excited at a different energy level. And that's what helps us know which atom is present in our sample. So is it this one or this one or which one is it? And so here we have an animation. Um, we can see the X-ray, the electron that is expelled, another one that changes subshell, and by doing so, a photon is released. So once this process happens, we get an XRF uh, spectrum that would look like this. And so how do we read it? So first of all, there is this X-axis that represents the energy contained in the photons that are emitted by the atom. So just like Olivia said, uh, the ejected photon contains a certain amount of energy level that characterizes every element. So then we're able to identify the element. And then we have the y-axis over here that uh, represents the number of photons detected by the beam line. 
or in other words, the intensity. So this allows us to compare the intensity of different peaks from the height. For example, if we look at the peak right here, we know it's sync because um, according to the reference booklet right here, we know that the energy level of zinc, well, the energy level that the photon carries emitted by zinc is 8,620 electrons. So, uh, and then if we compare the height of the peaks, we know that zinc is when uh, the intensity of zinc is higher than this peak, well, than all the other peaks from the y axis. So finally, now the part that everyone has been waiting for, results. <laughs> we divided our results into three categories based on the link to the literature that we consulted. So first, our results that are coherent with the literature that we consulted, others that shed light on a new area in phytoremediation research, and finally, a mystery result that required a lot of thinking and would be definitely interesting to research further. So our first bit of the conclusion that is consistent with the literature is that there is a higher concentration of heavy metals that we spike the soil with in contaminated plants. And this is exactly what we expected. And so for example, if we look at the spectra over here, we can notice the absorption of nickel, copper, zinc, and lead. And if we see um, the peaks that the contaminated groups did, so the colors green and red, like the Christmas colors, and we can see that it's much higher for um, these ones than for the control ones, which are the blue and orange. And so we see this difference of peak between control and contaminated roots, so as you can see, this is roots that are sampled at the same time, but it is also seen in stems, leaves, and stem, stamen. And so this correlates with literature, which indicates that squash can absorb metals. And so this confirms our first part of the hypothesis concerning the phytoremediation capabilities of the squash. So another element we observed that was consistent with literature was the presence of lead in all the parts of the plant except for the stamens. So as shown in the spectra, we can see that this is the peak for lead, and this is also another for lead. If we look at the contaminated stem in green, the contaminated leaves in red, and the contaminated roots in purple, we can see that there's a peak right here and right here. If we see um, the spectra of our stamen samples, which are the orange one and the blue one, we can see that it's flat, and right here there isn't any bump that would indicate the presence of lead. But does this mean that our stamen samples contain absolutely no lead? Well, maybe or maybe not. Because when looking at our uh, spectra, orange and blue, our stain spectra, even though they're flat, it might be because the concentration levels of, in the stamen were too low to be detected by the beam line. But we know that um, for stem, leaves, and roots, the concentration is higher. So we know this for sure. Um, also, it's important to note that when detecting lead, Instead of probing the probing, um, instead of probing the K shell, we're probing the L shell. So um, the K shell, as Olivia mentioned before, is what happens for the elements that we explained previously. So the electron from the K shell gets kicked out. But for the lead, since it's a heavier atom, uh, if we want to kick out an electron from the K shell, it takes way too much energy. So what, with our energy level, we're able to kick out the electron from the L shell. And, but in, for that to happen, uh, there needs to be a lot of lead. So the concentration, the actual concentrations of lead in our samples might be higher than what we see right here. So jumping back to our observation of, of um, absence or the small concentrations of lead in stamens, it correlates with literature that we read. So one of the articles that we read showed that there was much less, um, much less high concentration of lead in the reproductive organs. And after discussing with 
CLS's Dr. Chitra Karunakaran, we understood that a plant is smart enough to avoid absorbing the toxic elements such as lead um, in the reproductive organs to avoid transmitting them to the fruits of the next generation. <laughs> so we don't have any fruit samples to determine whether or not a squash grown in contaminated soil is safe to eat. But with the semen results, it seems to suggest that a fruit grown in contaminated soil could be free of lead. If it isn't found in the reproductive organs, it wouldn't be in the fruit either, right? However, as mentioned before, there is still a possibility of lead in the stamens, just very low concentrations. Um, so it's not high enough to be detected. But moreover, even if the reproductive organs do not have lead, this doesn't mean that once fertilized, the fruit won't absorb more lead from the soil. In fact, an article from Galal in 2016 did find the presence of lead in the fruit in a squash fruit. So, therefore, we can't 100% uh, come to the conclusion that fruit grown in contaminated soil is safe to consume, but we know that it is less concentrated in the male reproductive organs. So on to our last result that is consistent with the literature. Sushmita, can you tell us why we decided to look into the presence of calcium and iron in roots, stems, and leaves? Well, we were intrigued when the spectra, uh, spec, spectra showed higher absorption of calcium and iron in uncontaminated soil. So uh, we can understand without data that absorption of calcium and iron, which are metals very useful for the plant, uh, was stunted by the non-trivial presence of other heavy metals. So it totally makes sense, right? And that's why we try to understand how essential elements behave in a plant during different states of phytoremediation. First of all, to understand our data properly, we use normalization. This allowed, it to, this allowed us to observe which samples had more calcium and iron by creating consistency in one of these two essential metals. So in other words, we use the results we had to build new spectra where the amount of one metal was consistent in order to have an observable order of the relative concentration of the other. So it's as though we used a common denominator. For instance, here, we normalize the calcium to see intensity of calcium uh, in our uh, stem uh, to see uh, how related concentration of iron varies uh, in, again, the stem. We apply this normalization, so to calcium for the other plant parts, and then uh, we normalize the iron to observe the relative concentration of calcium in all of those same parts. So these results indicate that time has an impact on the related concentration in iron and calcium in both contaminated and uncontaminated plants. So when the iron was normalized, so all the, the iron peaks are the same on the spectra, we noticed that the relative concentration of calcium decreased through time in the roots and stems, whereas it increased in the leaves. These observations were applicable for both contaminated and uncontaminated samples. Through scientific reading, we learned that calcium is a metal essential to growth because it solidifies cell walls. This made sense uh, with our results. Um, by concluding that the roots don't, and roots and stems don't need much calcium towards the end, so it can go down through time because their growth is minimal compared to a leaf's at the same time, which needs an increasing amount of calcium because it's always building new biomass. So he, here we normalize the calcium to see um, how related concentration of iron varies. So he, here we can see that. In roots and stems, the iron is increasing in both parts of the plant when uh, calcium is normalized, and in the leaves, it's liquid. Oh, oh quite. <laughs> According to literature, iron contributes to photosynthesis and the production of chlorophyll. So an increased uptake of iron is coherent because as the plant grows, it just needs an increasing amount of iron to bring to the leaves via the roots and stems. So it's kind of going through there. However, for the, the leaves, wouldn't a leaf need an increasing amount of iron as well? Well, the concentration of iron in the leaves decreases through time because of the smartness of the plant. Let me explain. 
So I am the stem and uh, the root, and this is my leaf. So my leaf is becoming weaker day by day. So it needs uh, to intake less nutrients resources from the root and the stem. So I am smart, I'm the plant, and I'm not gonna provide any much more resources to the leaf that time. I will uh, load the resources elsewhere. And as a result, we assume that this was the case with the leaf we took to sample because we didn't know how old they were. So both these results link back to our research question and hypothesis. Firstly, because the lesser relative concentration of essential metals in contaminated plants indicate that there are health consequences uh, linked to the consumption of a fruit grown in contaminated soil that go further than heavy metals in bioaccumulation. So in other words, it's not just that heavy metals are present in the food that we're eating, it's that it's taking away other essential ones that would normally be there. Furthermore, looking uh, at the progression of uh, uh, calcium through time, we could give insight on the impact of time on the way plants absorb metals through time. This understanding could also be beneficial to phytoremediation research. Now that we've gone through the consistency with literature, let's move on to the second category of our results. So using the mapping technique, we were, well, uh, the mapping technique on our contaminated leaves. This allowed us to contribute a little bit to our research. But what exactly is mapping? So basically, it, cons it consists of illuminating a small section of our sample using tiny X or F spots in order to determine the composition at that certain point. And then the X-rays will move spot by spot, pixel by pixel, in order to create a two-dimension image that kind of looks like this. And so we wanted to bring new information to the field of phytoremediation by analyzing our leaf samples through the XRF mapping technique in the hopes of having a, a greater understanding of the dispersion of the heavy metals in the plant. And so we did the mapping on this leaf, and here we can see the images that illustrate the concentrations of each metal. And so the warmer and darker the color is, the higher the concentration is. So with the resolution that we have, we noticed that the contamination of the soil did not affect the dispersion of the different heavy metals in the leaves, meaning um, it is similar in the contaminated and in the controls, the dispersion of the heavy metals. However, despite the fact that our results may indicate that the, met the metals are slightly dispersed, for example, we can see this in the nickel, the lead, and the zinc, um, the heavy metals seem more concentrated in the veins of the leaf. So I can point this out. And this makes sense for two reasons. Firstly, because the veins contain the water, which makes it possible for the heavy metals to be dissolved and then transported through the leaf. And since the transportation happens in the veins of the leaf, they are thicker and they give off, they may give off a bigger signal. To help you understand the beneficial of higher resolution image that images are, this is a bio XIS uh, imaging of a healthy leaf from the CLS website by Dr. Gozia Corbis. So bio XIS is another beamline whose mapping offers more details with a higher resolution. So this shows a higher concentration of zinc in the veins, uh, something that we also found. However, we were wondering why our mapping leaves show that the metals are more dispersed compared to here where we can see that they're more present in the leaves. Well, Dr. Chishar Kadunakaran mentioned that the reason why um, might be because the fact that our resolution was way too low, so the, pre the precision isn't the best. That's why the beamline might be detecting the presence of zinc, even though it was much more concentrated in the veins. However, we should now address the elephant in the room. What exactly do we mean by mystery? After obtaining and analyzing our data, a trend stood out to us, something quite mysterious and interesting. So this trend, we obtained all across of our samples. So what does our data suggest exactly? Our main observer, observations are being higher relative concentration of potassium for the control in steps. So over here, we have our spectra. We're going to pay attention right over here. Um, so our control being the blue spectrum and the orange being the 
contaminated spectrum uh, sample. So over here we can notice that the, the higher relative concentration is for oh my gosh is oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we know that the orange spectrum being the contaminated sample, uh, the control spectrum shows a higher relative concentration than the contaminated sample. Oh, but wait, what is this thing right here? Yeah, that peak. Um, it's quite interesting, but maybe you can tell us more about that. Well, according to the data we collected and to this orange ribbon right here, um, this mysterious peak represents rubidium in our samples. So for those who are not familiar with, with it, sorry. So rubidium and potassium, as you can see, are located one above each other on the periodic table. They both have one valence electron. They're both alkaline metals. So they have similar chemical properties. They look alike and they, beha and they, they behave alike as well. We can say that they're chemical analogs and just think of them as fraternal twins. They're almost exactly the same. And just like how we would often stereotype twins, potassium and rubidium, they are often found together in nature, just like twins in real life. But isn't there a difference? Of course. But however, to speak before about, it is frequent that the membrane transporter in the plant mistakens the rubidium ion, iron, ions for the potassium ions. Therefore, Certain potassium ions are not absorbed by the plant at the expense of the absorption of rubidium ions. It is notably the case for cadmium and calcium as well. Rubidium and plant potassium are far from having the same effects in the plant metabolism. Rubidium and potassium differ from each other because their functions are quite distinct. Potassium plays a vital role in the translocation of the many nutrients and water within the plant structure. So from the roots to the stem to the above ground structures as well. Um, more so, the potassium trigger activates the enzymes within the plant. However, even more so, the potassium even um, provides structure to the cell walls. However, rubidium on the other side stunts the overall growth and development of the plant since it causes stress in the overall nutrient intake. However, Zian, what conclusion can we draw from the data we obtained? Well, good question. So according to our data and a comprehensive literature, literature review, we can see that we can see that when there is a deficiency of potassium in the soil for many reasons, the plants tend to absorb um, rubidium to compensate for this lack of potassium. Because as we can see here, the blue spectrum had more potassium, so it had less rubidium. And the orange spectrum had a bit less potassium, so more rubidium. However, in order to confirm all of this, we'll have to conduct another larger scale research and do a more comprehensive analysis. It is also important to mention that this peak before until now was not detectable. One of the potential and main reasons why this was the case it could be that Dr. David Muir over here has recently upgraded the monochromator. As a result, our samples were introduced to higher intensities of energy. Therefore, the lower relative intensity spectra are more likely to be observed than the former. In other words, we can trace a parallel between this concept and real life. Let's say Tracy over here is staying late at work and is dying of hunger. She has in front of her a bowl of candy that is quite tempting. Whereas at home, she has a home cooked meal prepped for her, but she was gonna probably gonna eat the candy, you know? Because, um, and to compensate for her hunger instead of waiting to eat her home cooked meal. Well, in our case, the rubidium is the candy for the plants. The plants, they absorb this element to compensate for a, the, the potassium deficiency, even though it's bad for them. It's like a metabolic response because they need the elements, they don't have a choice. Moving on with the source of errors. So our first source of error was that we did not keep a sample of the soil we bought. And that sample, that soil we bought, could have contained heavy metals in small quantities that were not taken into consideration. And now we're wondering how it could have impacted our results. We don't know. The second point was that, unfortunately, in the second half of our experiment, there was a 
fungus infestation that probably affected our results. The fungus might have influenced the absorption of different heavy metals. And while it would have been fun to repeat the experiment, but with fungus-free plants from the beginning till the end. Moreover, the maturity of each sample was not considered. It would have been preferable to mark each sample by date to trace adequate parallels. It would have also been better to take notes of the overall appearance of the leaves when sampling, or also other samples as well. We can then absorb the physiological features of the plant and how this may the heavy metal absorption could have um, could have affected the plant. Considering the weight of each sample would also have been beneficial to keep amounts of sample that we were going to scan identical. We would have to load the samples in the same way. So we'd like to uh, thank our teacher, our mentor, our indigenous reference, our trip organizer, all the lab techs and other staff at school, uh, the CLS staff for their tremendous help and mostly for giving us this opportunity to use the synchrotron. Um, as well as our school's financial aid services um, to help us come on this trip. Thank you for your attention. So uh, what are you wondering about? What are your questions? <laughs> yes, yes. The, the fungus station, did it increase? Metal uptake or decrease? Or, or? Um, so at first it was a bit of fungus, and then we tried to treat it with um, baking soda and black soda. And and black so soda. Black so we, but then, however, it persisted on and it spread to other every plant despite our efforts to minimize it. But since we the fungus appeared and it was over a break. We came back to school and the fungus was there. So we didn't, we couldn't properly track the moment that it appeared. But I think definitely if we'd had better data on the moment exactly where it appeared, it would have been super interesting to look at the leaves before and after since they were so close in time and figure out how the fungus impacted our results. So, I mean, we said that we wanted to do the research without fungus, but recreating it with fungus would have been super interesting to figure out exactly its role. Um, you mentioned that you used SRF and not structured to do samples. Um, did you have to do like multiple uh, experiments on the same samples, or do you have any plans for what you're going to do with the samples? Um, so I think what we wanted to do, the main reason why we didn't want to destroy them is that we wanted to um, do some XRF or mapping and then see if we wanted to grind them. So before grinding everything, um, we wanted to have an opportunity for mapping. And this is exactly what we did. We needed to map the leaves before to see if there was a difference between the dispersion and contaminated and contaminated prior to grinding them. So we we needed to look for pertinent data before deciding to run them all. So this is why mapping was beneficial to us. Okay. Yes. Okay, so my first reaction to you saying you found the rubidium was I don't think. <laughs> but then I looked something up. So do you know what energy the beamline was set to for the XRF data where you saw the video? 15,000. 15, 15, yeah. Actually, 15,000? No. Uh, you need a approximation. Approach. That's around 15,300. Okay, because the binding energy of the K shell for Rubidium is 15,200. And you know, we've just done an upgrade. So the reason I've never seen this before is that the beam line couldn't detect it before. The other thing to remember is if your excitation energy is just slightly bigger than than the binding energy of the K-shell, that means you'll be very, very sensitive to even small amounts of mm -hmm. So how come you don't have any fruit? Because one of your research questions was, is the fruit safe to be? You didn't have any fruit. Why, why no fruit? Because we grew our part. You want to go ahead? We grew our plants um, in interior, so we many we manipulated into uh, like art school, and we have a lab, so we grew our plants horizontally there, and um, we uh, colonized our female and uh, female flower and male flower uh, with Q 
So that's why maybe didn't work. And also um the light, we well, we had control such as light and um some uh because the flowers were up like up in the cell, um it could happen that we uh, we anticipate that uh, the light didn't reach into the flowers and there was a lack of light maybe so we didn't have fruit and another thing to add on what you said was that for our contaminated plants we actually didn't have any female flowers that grew every time there was a female flower we wanted to pollinize it was from a control one so not contaminated so we really wanted to have a contaminated fruit but not even a fertilized one or uh, a female reproductive organ, so that's sad. And even if we manage to find a female flower, their lifespan is very short. I think it's like 12 to 24 hours. So it was very hard to coordinate, to pollinize, to pollinize before it's too late the flower dies. There's, there's a few plant scientists in the room, and I'm sure they tell you one of the problems with plant scientists, there's an awful lot of variables to ensure you. Know. So if you find that too confusing, physics is where you should go. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, I get the last question, right? Okay, so um, you, you have anticipated some of the questions I'm gonna ask, so you forced me to up <laughs> my game. Okay, so uh, you opened up your, your presentation with the, the statement that it, you've had a very rich learning experience, okay? You know that I typically ask, what have you learned? So I'm not going to ask that question, okay? I'm, um, I'm going to ask you, what advice do you have for students who have not had the benefit of your experience? What should they think about and try and and to, to, to compensate for what you've got that they don't. And I'm gonna give you guys a minute to think about that. I yeah. just have a question, so yeah. to participate? So you got to participate yeah. in this. Your well, classmates well, do, did not. Okay. So what advice do you have for them? If they're willing to participate. No, not, no, no just, no, in just like, in as they go forward. Okay. What have you learned from this oh, that they okay. don't get? Yeah. So what advice do you have for them? And while you guys think of that, I'm going to talk to them. So you guys have a minute to think. <laughs> okay, so for your guys' benefits, they let me uh, they let me know inadvertently that they had gone and watched other student presentations. And so they know the big question that I ask at the end. So that's why I'm not asking that question. So if I stalled long enough, are you guys good? Yes. Okay, so each of you has to answer. Yes. Okay. I'm go. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so through this experience, we've learned all about um, ourselves. I find it's um, an interesting, interesting project where we learn a lot about ourselves and as a team, um, our different work ethics and um, how we organize ourselves among us and building trust among ourselves. So I feel like people who have not yet experienced this type of enriched experience would like lack in that kind of experience. So maybe try to how do I say this? Um I'll close this. No 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 like, no <laughs> no 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 yeah, uh, what I would give as an advice for like a new team or a team that will be going through this journey is that this is a type of project that we really don't, we're not used to this type of project at school, you know, it's something so broad, you, you know that there is the beam line that will detect the presence of certain heavy metals, but it's so broad you can do on any other subject, so I'm really, I really want to encourage the teams to look through multiple choices of subject before now narrowing it down to one just like we did we we were thinking about like mercury and fish or uh heavy metals in water in montreal like um uh oh, montreal, suburbs. And, yeah. suburbs and 
um, before looking, discovering phytoremediation, which was very interesting for us, and that's why we landed on that subject. I think my take is kind of summarized by when you have lemons and make lemonade, because and lemonade is better than lemons, right? So I was expecting to find that get squash at the start, like in last year, but we didn't. But I learned so much more from this than I would have if we'd found out. Oh, fine, there are metals in squash, and it's not safe to consume. What we learned here, I think, is so much more interesting, and I'm now realizing that even though you might not have the results that you want to obtain. There's always so much more to learn and you can you can have results. There, there are graphs, there are results there and you should seize the opportunity to try to make the most of them. So I suggest just to not get disappointed and yeah, you just make lemonade. So the one advice I would give to other teams is, is that rely on each other and like we grew as a team and it's like we talked it about yesterday or like a day before. And we had so much, we grew as a team and we like learned about each other. We built up as a team. And the, the, at the beginning, um, we had like many art articles to read, like a lab of hundred pages and we divided our part. Our part. So I can't go read Olivia's part and say, oh, I wanna read this part also. It's so much work. I have to build on what the person behind me did. So I think that's a lesson I have took and I would give that to others. So one thing that I learned throughout this project and that I think would be beneficial for other people to have is to be confident enough to share your opinion, to make it valued by other people. Because that was quite a challenge for me. I learned to like speak up for myself, to share my thoughts and my opinions. And in life, I think that's quite important. So. One piece of advice I would give to every student or even adult starting their career would be to accept the fact that you cannot always do things in advance. It's good to be proactive. It's good to take advances in things, but sometimes it's just not possible and you have to be fine with it. So for example, sometimes we're thinking of preparing the entire presentation, everything except for the graphs in advance, and then we realized it was impossible. We needed to wait until it's the right time to do all those stuff. So I this exact that. moment is the proof of that. We couldn't yeah. prepare. Not that I couldn't prepare for Tracy the new question. <laughs> yeah, we try to anticipate. Right. Bless Here's you. one of us. Okay. No, my, my, Madame Rodriguez, you're not off the hook either. <laughs> so so as a teacher who has had you know the experience to bring, this is your second group that you brought through, but the first in person. What advice would you have for other teachers that have not had the benefit of being able to do this? Can I answer in French? Oui. Because my English is uh, not uh, good enough to be recorded. So, <laughs> so uh, maybe I can answer in French and someone of you can uh, translate them for the audience. Um, more... Uh, mon, mon, mon conseil, ce serait de, ben, vraiment de laisser les élèves s'occuper eux-mêmes de leur projet, parce que c'est leur projet. C'est eux qui doivent le mener du début jusqu'à la fin pour s'investir au maximum. Et il euh, faut vraiment que le professeur se mette en arrière, soit le guide pour s'assurer que ça avance comme il faut, puis qu'on réponde aux attentes. Laisser les élèves écrire à Tracy, laisser les élèves chercher les mentors, laisser les élèves s'occuper de tout, mais s'assurer que tout se fait correctement. Puis ça va être une expérience formidable et pour le prof et pour les élèves si on les laisse euh, s'envoler euh, de leurs propres ailes. So, to translate what Mrs. Rodriguez just said, her advice for teachers is to let students more on their own, to be more autonomous, to let them do their projects. I mean, yes, the teacher has to be there as a guide, to guide students in the right direction, but mostly it's to let us do our thing, like let the students reach out to mentors, let the students write the letters to Tracy, to Amanda. Yeah, just trust them. Yeah, okay. because they are allowed to, to mm -hmm. do. Very good. Thank you all. Fantastic. Thank you all for your time. There are some cookies and other snacks at the back. And thank you all for joining us. We will be ending.